You gotta love this title, eh? Cutting Through the Smoke. Valuation in the Age of Cannabis and Cryptocurrency. You could probably call it popping the bubble, bursting the bubble as well. I was listening to a podcast today and someone was likening what's happening now with cannabis and crypto to the tech bubble. I think there's a lot of validity in that. Anyhow, typical disclaimers here, of course. What we're saying is, of course, my opinion and not the firm's. Okay, how do we cut through the smoke? We cut through the smoke by having a basic understanding of some of the principles of valuation. At the risk of boring everybody terribly, I'm just going to go over this for about five minutes. That will allow you to pop the bubble. Uh, we're then going to talk briefly about valuation of cannabis companies, and we're also going to talk about valuation of, of cryptocurrencies and blockchain type enterprises. Interesting thing in the same podcast, um, there was a reference or a referral to a another podcast by the Bank of uh, Canada Governor, and they're talking about the Bank of Canada developing their own cryptocurrency. So it's sort of interesting, isn't it? Because if the whole point of the blockchain and crypto is to cut out the middle man, and you see the central banks trying to develop their own blockchain and crypto, once again, are things going to be that different a few years from now? Hard to say. John referenced fair market value. You could ask a number of people, and probably you'd get six different definitions of fair market value. Quite important to understand what fair market value is and how it differs from price. Fair market value, the highest price in terms of cash at which a property exchanges hands between a willing and able buyer and seller acting at arm's length in an open and unrestricted market when neither party has a compulsion to buy and both have reasonable knowledge of relevant facts. Just think about some key things here, some key reasons why what we observe in the market with respect to prices for either cannabis stocks or cryptocurrency or blockchain enterprises or any commodity or any, uh, any business asset for, for that matter. Some of the things that could impact price versus value. For example, if I really want something, I may be willing to throw caution to the wind and purchase it. I don't care if it's worth $2, I'll pay $4, I'll pay $6, I'm going to pay $8. What, you're willing to pay 9 I'll pay 10 What, you're 15 I'll pay 20 for it. Wait a minute, is it really <coughs> worth 20 Well, maybe it's not worth 20 Why did I get it? Because I really, I am as excited, I wanted it, that's why. Compulsion to transact. What about this? I want to sell my business. Why? Well, because I want to retire. I hate the business. I sell it. How much you want to give it to me for? Two dollars? Fine. It's here for two bucks. I just walk away. Does that mean it was worth two dollars? No, it means the price was worth two dollars. What about this? This gentleman here buys a business. He doesn't have any funds though, so he goes to this fine gentleman here and says, I want to buy your business. This guy says, fine, it's worth a million dollars. He says, I don't have any money. He says, it's worth a million five. And he says, fine. So wait a minute. Is it worth a million five or is it worth a million? So you can see all these reasons why a price that you hear, you're getting your hair cut. It's like, geez, Bob just sold this business for six times revenue. What you don't know is why did somebody pay six times revenue? Was there compulsion? Was it a cash deal? All those factors are very important. Reasons why fair market value may be different than price. In the context of tax, What does CR mean, CRA mean when they talk about fair market value? Well, the fair market value that they refer to is similar to the definition here. Anyhow, some basic principles. Once again, why are we going through this lecture? This is what will enable you to cut through the smoke. Value is at a point in time. It's not what it was worth yesterday or tomorrow. It's worth worth today. It's perspective. It's always based on future cash flow, the expectation of future cash flow. You know, Rubik's Cube made a lot of money a lot of years ago. How much is it worth now? Nothing. Why? Because it's not going to generate any future cash flow. So once again, when we're looking at a particular business, geez, look what it did in the past. It did great. That's fine. That's in the past. What's it going to do in the future? It's a function of cash flow, as I said. Value is influenced by underlying net tangible assets. Now, this is an interesting concept, a very interesting concept. Two companies, both identical in all respects, both generating a million dollars of after-tax cash flow a year. Company A has assets and cash and hard assets. Company B has no assets. Both are identical in all respects, so with respect to what they're generating. What company is riskier? Obviously, the company with nothing in it 
to support the value is riskier. Once again, in the context of cannabis and crypto, how does this impact it? Let's take a look at what we're investing. Let's like, take a look at what's driving value. Two cannabis companies, one with real estate, one with brand, one with inventory, another cannabis company with an idea. Okay, different levels of risk. Same goes for blockchain and uh, to some extent crypto. We'll talk about that later. Um, a couple other things, value is influenced by liquidity, of course. And the value of a minority interest may be worth less than the value of a controlling interest. We're going to talk about that in a second. Coming back to point three from the bottom here, commercial and non-commercial value are distinct concepts. Personal goodwill is not transferable. Very important as well. Think about this. In these smaller operations that we may be considering, how key a role does that one specific individual play? If one specific individual plays a key role and that individual is not transferable, in other words, as soon as that individual steps out the door, the goodwill disappears, how much are you going to be willing to pay for the company? Less than otherwise would be the case if, in fact, the individual had, had, had uh, allocated that knowledge to the, to the actual corporation. So once again, the personal goodwill associated with one person is essentially of no value to anybody else. And that's a very key concept. Generally speaking, two different ways of valuing businesses. One, as we see here on the left, if it's a going concern, then the standard approach is that we've all seen. The income approach, market approach, or cost approach, we'll talk about those in a second once again. On the right-hand side, if it's not a viable business, then it's essentially worth what its net assets are, typically on a liquidation basis. Okay, so what about valuing cannabis and crypto? Where does this all fit in? Generally speaking, on the left-hand side, most of these businesses are going concern approaches. The income approach, once again, based on future cash flow. The market approach determines value with reference to either observable multiples of other companies, i.e., my company must be worth this because the other company is trading at, uh, at 20 times revenue. Therefore, my company must be or the transaction approach, whereby my company must be worth this because John just sold his company for five times revenue. Once again, transaction, basing it on revenue. Guideline company, basing it on multiples. What's the problem with this transaction approach? Once again, I don't know why you chose to sell your company for five times. Did you have to sell it? Were you a better negotiator? Did somebody just really want to overpay for it? Very, very key considerations here. Diversified business in the cannabis sector. Okay, we're kind of switching, switching channels here. We're going to talk about valuation of cannabis. So this thing is actually really, really uh, increasing and diversifying. We have our cultivation, production, distribution, life sciences, specialty finance, technology, everything that's fine, except one thing that I just saw today. I'm going to read you this, okay? Here's the headline of the article. Maine Lobster Eatery sedates lobster before cooking them. This is a true story, folks. I didn't make this up, okay? A lady by the name of Charlotte Gill, who was a very adamant fish rights activist, okay? Charlotte Gill, I, I didn't make that stuff up, okay? <laughs> One of those unique individuals that wants, <coughs> that cares about our fish and the feelings of our fish, and particularly with a specialization in crustaceans. She also happens to own, though, Charlotte's Lobster Pound, which is a very famous lobster cookery in New Hampshire. So she owns a lobster restaurant. You could go there right now, and if you want, you could request that your lobster be sedated with marijuana prior to cooking it. Seriously. I kid you not. I don't make this shit up, okay? <laughs> so she always felt bad being a crustaceans right activist, of course. Charlotte Gill always felt bad. Uh, she took a test case. There was a lobster, okay, a two and three quarter pound lobster by the name of Roscoe. I'm making this up. I'm not making this up. So what they did is they uh, took ro lobsters, or excuse me, they took Roscoe's aquarium and they infused the water with cannabis smoke for a period of three weeks. During this time, Ms. Gill is quoted as saying, is, Roscoe was, was not quite as confrontational. At the beginning, Roscoe, you walk up to him and he's there like... You know, go to Safeway, go to TNT, walk up to the lobster tank, what do you see? Okay, after three weeks of basically hot boxing weed, 
Okay, Roscoe was just there like, hey man. After a while, he was last observed eating chips and playing video games, right? I don't make this up. Well, I made that part up. Of course, Miss Gill, being a good crustaceans right activist, released, lobs, uh, released Roscoe. Roscoe's fine to go, but now in her restaurant, this is what she does. So, interesting little, little comment, but I think the point here is the degree of diversification. This is hitting everything. This is going to hit everything. Uh, how do we value cannabis companies? Our same three approaches, okay? So the asset approach, uh, the, the income approach, or the market approach. We talked about the difference between guideline company, excuse me, guideline company methods, i.e. the value of my company is worth exactly what your company is trading for. A million reasons why that isn't the case. My company's small, yours is big. Mine is diversified, yours isn't. I have bad management, you have good management. I don't have any money, you have good money. What's the expectation? <coughs> your company is probably trading at a higher multiple than mine. So, if you're trying to value a smaller company with reference to a larger company, chances are you're gonna get an inaccurate answer. Second one, and we're gonna bring Fred up here, who's gonna talk about this, the transactions method. My company is worth this because your company is sold for that. Now think about the ridiculous landscape that's out there today with companies transacting at ridiculous multiples. You can see a lot of reasons why the fair market value may be different than the price. Fred, why don't you come and talk a bit about some transactions. Great, thanks Mark. Hi there. Uh, a bit of background, I, I spent the bulk of my career advising uh, corporate development officers and CFOs of public companies, and as well as, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, investment managers for private equity funds. And the commonality bit behind both of these uh, entities is they have a lot of capital, and they need to deploy it, so they're chasing returns. And so, you know, I started this profession in 1997, you know, I've been through the, the dot-com, the dot, you know, the bubble, I've been through the oil and gas sector, run-ups, uh, real estate, uh, mining, and now we're into cannabis. So the commonality theme is, as what Mark mentioned, um, we're trying to uh, value companies based on theoretical principles for fair market value. But what you see in the, in the, in the uh, real transaction space are price, which consider elements as such as these entities have a lot of capital and they need to deploy it. So whenever you turn on the you know, BNN, you see all these public companies trading at uh, certain multiples. Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that many of uh, people making these investments are chasing the opportunity. They want to get in on the ground floor. You know, to quote Warren Buffett and ben Benjamin Graham, you know, I'm a, I was a finance undergraduate. They're trying to invest in companies so that so they get on the ground floor and they build a moat around it. They, they, they make that business such as uh, their capital appreciates and that's why price could differ from fair market value. So having said that, let's look at some tr um, transactions. I hope you can see it. Um, and there's another screen there for the people at the back, focus on that. So market approaches. So some, sometimes we value companies using uh, stock market based trading multiples of uh, com larger companies in the sector. And funny thing is that you can see it says data as of August 31st, 2018. So I prepared this, you know, at the end of the summer, you know, at the month end. So right now, you know, we're into September, late September. These numbers as of August 31st were, are obviously a lot lower. So you take a look at it. I mean, we take a look at some of these, the larger players in the, uh, in the space. You know, they, they have, you know, on a per share basis, you know, some are actually having some earnings, but many are, you know, in the loss stage and even some are at the pre-revenue stage. Well, then flip down to valuation. We'll, we'll say the word valuation. Really, it's, it's a, a stock market price valuations. I have a lot of not meaningfuls. Not meaningful means basically it's negative. So, but these companies are still trading at, at a high inflated multiples, you know, price per revenue. A lot of it has to do with exactly what Mark said. It's many are, companies are just attracting capital to uh, chase after the, the low hanging fruit, the, the rate of return. So, um, flip forward, I did a, a little uh, spreadsheet on transaction multiples. And on the surface of it, you can see pointing at it, you know, at a multiple oh, negative EBITDA. They have no EBITDA on a reported basis, but they're still transacting at, at huge multiples. Enterprise value, you know, at three million for the bottom one. Aurora Cannabis buying Medleaf. Uh, negative, you know, not meaningful EV over EBITDA. But these companies are still transacting. You know, <coughs> revenues of uh, you know 56.4 uh, 
enterprise value based on revenue. Many of these companies are the, at the pre-revenue stage, but that doesn't cha uh, change the fact that many investors just want to get in on the opportunity. Um, but t touching back on what Mark was saying, if you, people want to ask, well, how are these companies valued? So it, interesting thing when I did my research, and if you go actually to CDAR, many of these public company transactions you know, for securities regulations need to have a fairness opinion. Um, sometimes the fairness opinion disclosures are uh, very minimal. But some of these transactions, such as the, uh, the one, uh, the Aurora Cannabis ones, they actually show the different, not they, they don't disclose how it's being valued, but they go through the different valuation methods. They describe discounted cash flow, trading multiples, and transaction multiples. But they consider all of them, and then they determine on the basis of their analysis about the transactions fair. So there is a rigorous process to value it, um, and Mark uh, highlighted uh, on the various different valuation methods. So, But leading to, this is a good uh, uh, slide that's always, Keep in mind when I say chasing the easy rate of return on a market-based uh, approach. Really, these are some of the things that are driving the cannabis sector. And it's no different than you know, the dot-com of 1999, pre-crash, pre, uh, or any of the oil and gas sector, or the mining sector. Really, it's an issue of there's a lot of capital on the sidelines, and they need to deploy it. They're looking for the opportunity. and so highlighting some of the, the key points, and I even printed out some press releases so as we get to it. Valuations metrics are very high. Many of them, these companies are unprofitable, but that doesn't mean um, they don't transact. A lot of large companies are trying to get in on the ground floor. First mover's advantage, exactly what I said uh, in my analogy, uh, the great investor Warren Buffett, he, he looks at certain companies. Right now, he's obviously uh, Berkshire Hathaway isn't looking at the cannabis sector due to uh, regulations in the U.S. But the, the, the thought, the uh, investment thesis uh, still holds. You get in at the, at the ground floor, you build up uh, synergies, and you, it's called building a moat, and then you realize the rate of return after that. No different than the mining sector or the uh, oil and gas sector. Many of these are private companies, and so uh, there's a lar large number of capital raises when I wrote down pr private placement offerings. Large public companies, you know, investing in cannabis companies, you know, Constellation Brands, the large uh, liquor uh, manufacturer, you know, the, the makers of uh, Jack Daniels whiskey and uh, Corona. So they, they invest in, um, they're investing in the cannabis space because they view it as a potential to grow their revenues. Molson Coors Brewing, they, they're also into it through forming partnerships. Exchange traded funds, the, you know, it's not just the big companies who are institutional investors who are actually deploying capital in there. You know, the, the retail investors such as you and I on an individual basis. Uh, maybe we don't want to invest in the public companies on a direct, uh, direct investing basis, so we invest in exchange traded funds. And so uh, certain uh, of these are being structured, such as uh, exchange traded funds for the uh, Horizon Group. So in, in essence, you know, it's, it's, it's really capital on the sidelines and just chasing after the rate of return. So, and in, you might view it as it's actually a share price issue. So things can move the share price. Yes, there are volatilities, but keep in mind it's just share price versus value. So I um, wanted to reference Mark and I were talking about transactions this morning. So, you know, and I actually print out the press release. So, so not to, uh, so I don't misquote um, any uh, official wording. So Tillery, the, uh, our uh, local Nanaimo based uh, publicly listed company. Their share price is, as you probably, it's going up and down, you know, it goes volatile. Well, you know, certain news, actually real news, and I don't want to quote Donald Trump, or fake news moves things. So real news, Tilray receives approval from U.S. government, which is the, uh, the DEA, Drug and, uh, Enforcement Agency, to import a me medical cannabis study, study drug for a clinical trial. So, you know, it lifts the share price. So that's real news. Uh, don't quote me out. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm on, on TV right now and being uh, filmed. Fake news. It's not so much fake news. It's official press release. So, Aurora Cannabis responds to media reports concerning rumor partnership with beverage companies. So it's a, a press release. So it is real news. September 18th. So I won't read it. But basically, in the sum of it, in the background, they're having discussions with Coca-Cola to uh, possibly go into partnership to produce, uh, you know, cannabis-infused uh, beverages. So. That sends a share price going everywhere where basically the, the company had to issue a press release to talk about it. So, so there's a lot of volatility. 
Is it true value, these share prices? I'm saying it could be or it couldn't be. Really, it's, it's price versus value. So in this case, I mean, Aurora Cannabis and Coke, I don't own, you know, full disclosure, I don't own any investments in the, the cannabis sector, but I do own shares in Coke. So for me, I hope it works out because Coca-Cola, it ain't going to get any higher by selling like uh, more Powerade or Dasani water. So I um, hope it's real news. So, um, And I'll turn it back over to Mark. Yeah, we're, we're, we'll just wrap this up in a second here. You know, from a tax perspective, this is something that is quite interesting. So why do we care about price versus value? Well, let's just say that there's some type of transaction. And let's say the company has to make some type of disclosure with respect to the fair market value of the shares. And let's just say that the company doesn't have a particularly robust story. It just is what it is because the company doesn't want to really make, spend a lot of money. They say this is what the value is. This is what it's worth. It's worth it's worth this, which happens to be one or two times revenue. And that's what it is. And that's all they say. There's no valuation attached to it. There's no, there's, there's no story. CRA takes a look at this, okay? And if they choose to select this particular transaction, they say, well, let's take a look at that value. And they say, okay, well, let's value this company. There's three approaches. There's the income approach. The company doesn't really make any income, so we don't really take that approach. There's a cost approach. Well, the cost approach doesn't measure future value. We can't lose that approach. Let's just use the market approach. So they go to their Bloomberg terminal or Capital IQ, and they tip up some transactions, and they see, oh, lo and behold, we have an average here of 56, 74, and 73 <coughs> times. Let's call it 65 times revenue. That's pretty good evidence. I think we are now going to assess this, reassess it, and we're going to use 65 times revenue because this is this. Here you go. These three transactions. This is what we saw. We're going to apply this methodology, and we now get this absolutely ridiculous answer. Would they likely to be likely to do that? Perhaps not, but I have seen situations where in the absence of a story to say this, there is no income, therefore we're not valuing it using an income approach. Cost is not appropriate because there is future value. Somehow, we're looking at these transactions. Here's why these multiples are too high. Here's all the characteristics and qualitative characteristics, why we're going to reduce those multiples. And here's a story which supports our value. And that somehow gets tucked along with the tax filing. It gives the taxpayer a basis, a story. Chances are, in many cases, the tax department kind of moves on and doesn't get the valuators involved. So, and I've seen, I've been actually in front of the tax court twice and dealing with situations exactly like this where the investor or the taxpayer didn't have an adequate story and as such it happened to get picked and, <coughs> you know, it's just a costly endeavor. I'm going to skip through the rest of the slides, okay, because we spent more time than really allocated here. We'll just talk briefly <coughs> about blockchain and crypto. Here's the good news, okay, cryptocurrencies price times value. But if it's not liquid, then obviously we have a problem, maybe a restriction there. Price times value times some type of restricted share discount. On the uh, blockchain companies, okay, quite interesting here. Here's the good news. Blockchain technologies company is just a technology company. It's either going to be valued using a cost approach, an income approach, or a market approach. Keep this in mind, okay? When you look at the observed price behind something, that price doesn't necessarily reflect value. It reflects, as Fred said in many instances, a compulsion to transact, looking, capital looking for a home. Using those basic tools, I think we can then cut through the smoke in valuing this.